they seem convinced that they are not getting a good enough deal out of the agreement. Now, um, it does come at interesting time. PNG is, of course, in the middle of an economic crisis, as is the rest of the world. But uh, it's a crisis that's been going on for quite a significant uh, period longer than the rest of the world's been in crisis. And so um, to, to make this announcement in the middle of that, well, that's a, um, a pretty significant announcement and also seems to have blindsided uh, Barrick uh, and uh, they have responded quite harshly in the public, uh, which has really you know, put a lot of bad blood in the air. So the PNG government is, is convinced that it's not getting a good enough deal. Uh, you know, they do get tax revenue uh, from this from this project, but they have a very they don't have an ownership stake in the project, and they seem to be wanting a bigger ownership share in in the project. Um, you know, they they are within their rights to do this. The lease has expired, but it seemed like Barrick was confident that they had no indication prior to this announcement that they weren't going to get a deal done, and they have yeah been uh, responded quite harshly in the in the press since. And the, and the government's ordered the government to negotiate and sit down and try and achieve some sort of outcome. Do you think they will be able to? Well, the courts have uh, have told them to to come back together and to uh, nego go to the negotiating table. Um, but both sides are playing pretty hardball here. The PNG government said there's no wiggle room. We're we're done with you. We want to go a different direction. You should respect our decision. And, but you, in the meantime, you should continue to operate. And Barrick has said, well, we're not going to do that. We're going to just cut off cease operations. That's 5,000 staff that are immediately out of a job. That's 10% of your exporting revenue, that uh, export value that you're going to lose. Um, you know, so it's getting pre it's gotten pretty nasty pretty quickly. And you know, whilst uh, you know Barrick, Barrick needs a, a contract to operate um, to to manage the mine, it also needs a social contract, not only with the PNG government but with the people of that province. And there needs to be a lot of trust in that system. And, you know, the way things have played out, played out in the last few weeks, even if they do get to an agreement, there's going to be a lot of uh, mending of the fence to be done in the months ahead. I'd imagine a lot of bad blood. And do you, if they do have another potential investor in the wings, uh, this wouldn't necessarily be a very good example of how they treat potential investors. Well, yeah, look, it's a high stakes game PNG government here is, is playing. And it may well be that there is a deeper game at play, that they have another uh, suitor in the wind. Um, you know, we don't know who that may may be. But, uh, you know, there is already a limited amount of investor confidence in Papua New Guinea. Uh, they have been playing hardball with a lot of uh, natural, re natural resource project negotiations. And this is certainly a shot across the bow to all those other negotiations. So they have to play this delicate game because they, of course, need to get the best deal possible for the people of Papua New Guinea. You know, you can only get, they are a commodity dependent economy and you can only get so many bites of the commodity apple. You know, there's only so many projects. So they need to make sure everyone is giving them the most value. But you also don't want to push too far to scare off the investors that need to bring in the capital, the expertise to actually, you know, um, bring these projects into reality. So it's a very delicate game and it's a very high stakes game for the PNG uh, people and the PNG economy um, and you know we're, we're right in the middle of seeing how it's all going to play out. Interestingly one of the big investors in uh, Barrack, uh, a Chinese investor, is saying that there will be severe consequences if uh, this agreement isn't uh, negotiated somehow. Of course we know China's been a big investor right across the Pacific. What might that mean for PNG? Yeah look there was immediate scepticism. Um, speculation when this deal was announced that you know perhaps china would be using this opportunity to jump on this big investment you know it's a it's a major gold mine billions of dollars still still on the ground it can operate for for many years and you know would help build that not only you know give them economic value but also build that geopolitical leverage in the region that they've been looking for over the last decade but uh, so there was speculation immediately we always like to jump at shadows when it comes to to china but, uh, you know, the way the, the embassy in PNG, the way the company that is a joint venture partner in, in the gold program mine with Barrick have reacted uh, since, it seems like they were just as blindsided as, the, um, as Barrick was in this decision. Let's uh, move to uh, a possible travel bubble between Australia and New Zealand. Now, there has been some commentary that Pacific nations who haven't been that badly impacted by coronavirus should be included in any bubble between the two countries. Do you think that's a good idea? Do you think it's feasible? Well, look, in principle, I think it's an abs absolutely a good idea. Uh, but, you know, we do need to pump the brakes a little bit. Let's not get too carried away or set expectations too high. Uh, you know, New Zealand, it, it's going to be first off the rank. There is a lot more faith uh, in our mutual health systems, uh, a lot more trust uh, of, of the, how those systems operate and effective quarantine and, uh, and customs processes between our two countries. 
Uh, and you know we are both on the same trajectory when it comes to responding uh, to dealing with the with COVID. Now, should it be opened up to Pacific Island nations? Well, there are a number of Pacific Island nations that, through uh, you know very good foresight and also good luck, have been able to avoid the virus altogether. They have no proclaimed cases now. On I believe those numbers, but the the Australian government, of course, has to have faith in those numbers as well. Uh, but then you know it does make sense for them to be led in next. But you, you know, it creates all sorts of other issues about what kind of assistance you put in place at the border. Uh, you have to have agreement that they can't, you know, then open up travel to other countries. You need to keep the bubble contained, uh, and then it creates some geopolitical headaches for Australia as well. You know, if you let some Pacific countries in and not others, well, you know, we're, we're, Scott Morrison is in the middle of a Pacific step up. Uh, he's calling it the Pacific family. Um, you know, people don't like you playing favourites in the family, and you know, the countries we're talking about here: Vanuatu, Samoa, Tonga, Solomon Islands. Well, some of the bigger, biggest countries in the region, Fiji, Papua New Guinea, uh, I can't see particularly Papua New Guinea being put into this agreement, uh, into this bubble anytime soon. So, you know, it's definitely worth uh, pursuing, but don't get your hopes up that it's going to happen anytime soon, and it's not without its own challenges. Indeed. Interesting points. Uh, Jonathan, good to talk. Thank you so much. Thank you.